It's insane to me that like mid three hundreds is is affordable housing, right? You know, because for years on the education circuit, the example of like, well, you got to buy it sixty five percent minus repair. So if you buy it a six hundred thousand dollar house, uh-huh. you got to buy it fifty, put twenty into it, sell it for a hundred, you make your twenty, blah right. blah blah. And it's like if you if you say that over and over and over over the past you know fifteen years for for educational purposes, just for examples, and then you're like, wait a minute. A hundred thousand dollar house. Yeah, like that's in, you, where are you gonna get that? Welcome back to Real Investing, where we talk about real investing for the everyday investor. I'm Tim Harridge. I'm here with Courtney Hemsley of Empire Development, uh-huh. and my friend Ryan Harper with Harper Belmont Media, which is not a real estate company, but it's okay. <laughs> but you're real estate <laughs> adjacent. adjacent. Real estate adjacent. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so welcome back. Thanks for stopping by, Courtney. Thank you for being here. Yeah, thank you for having me. Uh, yeah, so we're not going to record your knees, inside joke, <laughs> the blooper reel. Uh, Cut that out. <laughs> uh, yeah, so construction, fun things going on in the market? A lot of stuff going on in the market. Yeah? We still have a shortage of housing, so um, that hasn't gone away. So, Can we just jump straight to labor? Yeah. Shortage, surplus, getting easier. What's your read on construction labor these days? It's competitive with the guys, um, but a lot of the labor, they need work. Um, So it kind of goes both ways. Um, You can negotiate the pricing more because they need the work. Um, But it's most of your trades, most of your labor, if you're experienced in the industry, these are guys that you've known and been working with for years um most of my trades and labor i've been working with 10 plus years so um they're the first guys that i call they call me if they you know hey do you have anything else you know anybody that has anything so right now a lot of the labor they are reaching out i probably get calls daily um if i if i'm not utilizing the guys do you have anyone else that can utilize us um, for labor so this is why i brought this up first because obviously a couple years ago Mm-hmm. It was hard to get people to answer the phone, much uh-huh. less show up on the job. Right. And I mean, that was back in the day where roofing crews would leave halfway through the day and just get up and, <laughs> and go to another job. Yeah. And I've noticed that in my flipping business recently, I'm getting more calls from people looking for work. And mm-hmm. when I need something done, it seem it feels easier to get someone yeah. there. Right. So I'm just a one trick pony kind of ish. So I was just curious what yeah. a big company was feeling. Yeah. I mean, like I said, labor, when they're your guys that you've been working with for many years, they're going to call and reach out because they need the work. And then right. another trick to the labor in the industry is everybody wants to work up front because that's the big part of the paychecks. It's that last 5% in construction that kicks your, mm-hmm. I don't know if I can say that, but um, where they don't want to, they could care less if they come back for that last 5%. And they want to go get the first end money from a new job. So that's where usually labor kicks our butt on the construction or renovation side is, you know, if they come in, everybody's gung ho ready to get the job because that's where the big money comes in at the front. But then that last 5%, they don't want to come back to do. So again, you know, having the experience is hold- withholding <laughs> enough so they'll come back and complete it. So that's always a trick. So I'm glad you brought up labor because I know... With, uh, not me personally, but uh, I've had friends in the business mm-hmm. before where they would intentionally have projects that were maybe not full on loss leaders, but were break even mm-hmm. type projects just to keep their crews yeah. engaged. Going with what you were saying that tracks with years past. Is that still a thing now if there is a flood of labor that needs the job? So it seems like if I'm hearing that you don't necessarily need to take loss leader jobs because there's always a labor. There is always labor, but of course you have your select labor. I mean, you want the guys that are going to show up when they need to, um, whether it's a Saturday or Sunday, if things just need to get done that you trust that are going to do what they say they're going to do. Um, it, it just really depends on your guys and you don't want, if you have good guys, you don't want to lose them because I'm only as good as my team. I mean, I, I can bring in the jobs, I can create the opportunities, but uh, I know what to look for to see if it looks right, but I, I don't want to be out there physically doing the work all day, right. every day. So I'm, I'm really only as good as my team um, and I'll do anything to try to keep these guys busy or, you know, even if it is some instances where I am just breaking even so I can keep my guys 
available and with me um, so that's for still my future a thing job. It, it is for a, select key players yeah it's it still is a thing for yeah. key players yes so i bring that up first because i don't think it's getting enough publicity the jobs reports are getting a little worse kind of you know month by month and uh construction labor it's reported on like multifamily projects and commercial projects, but a lot of the boots on the ground labor in our single family housing industry doesn't really get reported on the job reports. But I'm always trying to, after, you know, 20 something years in the business and we try to be no fluff around here. Mm -hmm. Like obviously you're in the construction business. And so we'll, we'll talk about your business, but we try to talk about like what the real thing is on the street. And I am starting to feel some recessionary undertones in the labor market and the job market. And just frankly, in the way people are willing to spend and like they're, you know, instead of, Oh yeah, courts and the best light fixtures and all that. It's kind of like, eh, you know, do we need to do that? So that's why I ask. I just, obviously if you're doing a lot of projects, you, you're got, you got a good pulse. And, right. and the key thing she said though, is now people are starting to call for work versus, mm-hmm you're having to track them down. And is that when you say recessionary trends, is that what we're referring to is the trend that now you have an influx of labor that need work? Well, no, there's it, no work out there. There's less work. There, mm-hmm. There's becoming less and less available work. And people are kind of drowning in their auto payments and credit card payments and they need work. And, right. and there was a period there after that last election um, where people didn't need work. Mm-hmm. And people didn't really want work. And if they were going to show up, I mean, day labor skyrocketed where you're paying close to $300 a <laughs> yeah. day, uh-huh. up from $100 a day in 2019. Like, I mean, it was just right. an astronomical increase. And I'm starting to hear and feel that coming down a little bit. You just hope that we find balance and don't go all the way to where there's mm-hmm. people in line for food stamps. Right. Environment. Right. What about materials? Because there was a time uh-huh. where if you wanted drywall, you kind of had to be in line. You had to pick if you were going to be in line at the, the wood. grocery store to get toilet paper right. or Home Depot <laughs> to get drywall. Like, well, and there's the the, the lumber shortage as yeah. well. Yeah. So how are you see? How's the material market now? Materials mainly um, pricing is still competitive. Um, you know, you have um, those that will fight for your business, especially if you've been doing business for them for so long. Um, I always on materials, I'll get three quotes and then compare everybody and beat everyone down. I mean, it's just kind of the rule of the game. And you're not you're not shopping like Home Depot. You're talking about like a supplier. Like well, a Home supplier. Depot will come through on some things really? that you'd be the surprised. The bedroom, baby. Yeah, they, well, they the bedroom. What is, well, let's and, talk and, about and, and it. When what you is spend that? so much money, they give you additional discounts, and yeah, so you can get that. Then they also have where you don't pay the taxes on um, your materials as well. So once you spend a total volume um, with Home Depot, where you can get. They beat out lumber pricing for me than like um, some of the big lumber players. Do you like get like a lumber. host like at the casinos or something yeah. <laughs> yeah. that yeah, I know get, nothing you, about. You get a biz clearly. dev. You get a biz dev rep. You get okay. your, your your person. That, oh, biz dev rep. Yeah, that, not uh-huh. a host. That's not necessarily <laughs> at that Home Depot. Right. But you can they'll email come them. and visit. Like my guys, my Home Depot reps will come and visit me at the site. I don't even have to go into Home okay. Depot, and they'll. Um, and with those guys, I get even better pricing if I were to go into the Home Depot and, and work. And, so and in the bid room, the you asked, and that's a, probably a good little hack yeah. for the listener. Is it still twenty five hundred? Mm-hmm. So if you're if you're placing an order over twenty five hundred dollars, and you have a commercial pro account or whatever, uh-huh. you don't go to the register. You go over to the pro desk. You have it rang up, and you ask them to put it into the bid room. Right, and they'll send it back. And you'll get discounts that are significant. Mm-hmm. And then it's is it twenty five hundred a week or twenty five hundred a month? Usually, well, we do weeks. Yeah, it's like once you're told. in the bid room, then it's like a rolling bid room, mm-hmm. and like every order goes through the bid room. Yeah. So I imagine you guys probably never leave the bid room. <laughs> right. No, everything we we purchase is going to be bid room because what, we're what's doing funny is, multiple units. Is like you know in the in the real estate single family real estate investor world, there's always this: uh, is this person real? Are they not real? Uh-huh. Are they full of shit? Are they legit? <laughs> you know. So maybe instead of the question of like how many deals did you do last month, it should be like who's your biz dev rep? Yeah. Right, at Home Depot. Exactly. And if yeah. they don't have one, they're like, huh? if they do what I do, I'm like, huh? Yeah. And it's like, okay. Do you have yeah. Gary's cell phone or not? Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't yeah. know who Gary is. is that, uh, he's my guy. Okay. Yeah. yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Well, and, and and by the way, if you're, it, they, I think Home Depot's done. I'm going to talk about Home Depot for a minute. Yeah. Sponsorships are open. Um, hashtag Home Depot. <laughs> hashtag <laughs> well, Home Mr. Depot. They've payment. done probably the best job in the home services industry mm-hmm. with their app recently. Uh tracking all the perks like i always love to oh, get, like, I love the, the perks email. Like, i get the gifts yeah, yeah you get like a free tour rental or a hundred dollars yeah. off or whatever yeah but right. then also now download this thing and if you're in a store and you're looking for a hundred watt light bulb you just type it in and it tells you the bin and the aisle, aisle it's to in. go to yeah it is like if the grocery stores could figure this crap out <laughs> Men yeah. in the world would be so much happier. What's funny is, and it like, tells you how many they have in stock. I know. You're talking about the app. All I can think about is like the uh, home investors, like ten years ago, where they did a partnership with Home Depot, and they mm-hmm. were trying to do this like iPad app thing, and they were like pushing it hard. And I don't know if it ever took off. It, it, but... it got there, but it, I'm telling you, the Pro Extra app, they have yeah, done a it's... fantastic job. Because you know, Jennifer and I own houses in DFW, Austin, Waco, and San Antonio, mm-hmm. and they lay them all out a little different. Yeah, And it's just nice to go into the Alamo Heights Home Depot uh-huh. and say, I need air filters. And for some reason in this store, they're in the back right instead of the front left. You just type it in and go get it. Exactly and, where to go. Uh, like the ring cam. Like, I, I just love it. It's a great yeah, app. It Makes is. you go like the whole Ron Swanson thing of like, I know more than you. Have you seen that? <laughs> no, I, don't, I haven't seen that. Parks and, anyway, it doesn't. Well, I was just kidding. Parks and Rec character who's a very manly man. He goes to Home Depot. Home Depot guy's like, can I help you? He's like, I know more than you. Oh. <laughs> Neither one of y'all know that? No. Um, well, hopefully some When they do the reels, they can yeah. cut that in. Yeah, we'll put that little thingy. Yeah. It's funny. We will. Do I say know? we. The royal we. I mean, you will. Someone, or your team will. Someone will. <laughs> someone will. <laughs> It'll yeah. get done. It'll get done. <laughs> um, so, okay, materials, labor. What's mm-hmm. what's other uh, aspects of business? From the, demand from the industry. I mean, are you... Seeing kind of more landlord demand, more flipper demand, more developer demand. Where is the demand in the re- development and reconstruction uh, industry this, these days? Our focus is, so my team, we focus on more providing more of a an affordable housing, um, your everyday buyer. There are, you know, these builders that come in and do two million plus, and there are buyers for that. You know, those guys aren't um, affected by the economy right now, but... Our focus is a house that, you know, it's a first time buyer. We have some projects going on in South Dallas now that, you know, you have to make below a certain income in order to qualify, you know, so that gives these, um, these buyers an opportunity to have home ownership. Uh, We're starting, we just started the infrastructure and development on a property out in Greenville, Texas, where we are doing 150 single family homes, but it's a build to rent community. And a portion of it's going to be built to rent, a portion of it built to sell. But we're starting at ones, twos, and three bedrooms where you can actually buy a one bedroom unit, um, you know, that will start in the $200,000 price range that, you know, before that, someone couldn't go buy anything for 200000 right. So we're, we're creating in that on the residential side of our business, we're creating more of a housing that everyone because right now everything's just skyrocketing. Then you have the interest rates. But, you know, you have, you know, your first time home buyers, you have your older um, generation where, you know, they they don't want to go into a home and they don't want to live with family, but they still can, you know, get around and do things themselves. So our focus right now on the residential side is creating and providing housing that your everyday person can afford what what's what's considered affordable housing in the dfw market for like a three two um well obviously it depends on the area so for instance out in greenville where we're doing that development our three twos will go in the the mid 300s low 300s and and again I, i feel like a boomer yeah, right. but it's like you think- have gray hair now, but <laughs> so, so do you, bud. Look That's at your my face. beard. That's but your that face. could be because of age or stress. You just yeah. never both, know. Both. But it's, it's just it's insane. our friendship. Yeah, actually. <laughs> that too. It's insane you to both me. both have it. Yeah. <laughs> it's insane to me that like mid three hundreds is is affordable housing, right? You know, because for years on the education circuit, the example of like, well, you got to buy it sixty five percent minus repair. So if you buy it a six hundred thousand dollar house, uh-huh. you got to buy it fifty, put twenty into it, sell it for 100 you make your 20 blah blah right. blah and it's like if you if you say that over and over and over over the past you know 15 years for for educational purposes just for examples and then you're like wait a minute 
a hundred thousand dollar house. Yeah, like that's in, you, where are you going to get that? Well, right. for years the Dallas Fort Worth median price just chugged along right at two to three percent appreciation a year, mm-hmm. and in twenty eighteen it was around one forty one forty five. Today it's four hundred. Mm-hmm. I mean, in, what, it, it is six years astronomical yeah. how unaffordable housing's become. And now add on top of this, they're trying to build a, a $300,000, I'm going to round down, a $300,000 starter home. Mm-hmm. You got to realize the taxes on that will be $7,000 mm-hmm. a year. So if you're buying a starter home and you your family makes $100,000 a year, 7% of your income is going to property right. taxes. So what's a typical, like, and again, this is from my uh, ignorance and just not being in the business in a long time. You're adjacent. Adjacent, thank you. <laughs> but like, because it used to be like, if you could build at eighty dollars a square foot, uh-huh. that was a really good. And if you spend a hundred dollars, you could really make a really right. nice house. Uh-huh. What is it now? Um, we're so I, it depends on the quality, what you're putting in it. So right. we're right on, and on our builds, we're between one hundred to one hundred ten dollars per square foot. Okay, so not counting land though. Not counting land. Okay. No. So not, uh, yeah, not counting your land acquisition. So that's right. just to build construction cost. Right. And that, but that would also include like your grading and that type of stuff to, to prepare the site, to pour mm-hmm. and, and go vertical. So, in, you know, in, in the past couple of years, you know, with that little thing that happened in 2020. Um, <laughs> the election? <laughs> the other, both. But, you know, the, the, the exactly. All of it. All of it. it didn't Can happen. we just start referring to that as yeah. the last election? Yeah. That way we don't have to say the V word. Uh, What's the V word? Oh, that one. I was like, what is it? Victory? I like, yeah, no. yeah, I don't know. It's like a C word or the V word. You know? Hey! <laughs> but, but, but what I was going to get at is like, you know, because of that, per- the permit process went from like, Oh, unbearable crazy. to like impossible. Yeah. Where is it now? Uh, a lot of cities are doing things to help correct that. The city of Dallas has a fast track program now. Um, so if you build and you've done, of course, it's going to be to the builders or developers that have been consistent um, in that market. Mm-hmm. They have these programs where you can come in. Um, and, and like I said, really, it's just like anything. If you've um, been present in that market and you have the connections with the city the relationships yeah the relationships all about who you know um then you can they have a, these fast track programs with a lot of these cities so mm-hmm. you have to buy a guy it, a watch yeah something like that well, something no, has it, to happen. It, it's not just who you know though it's what you know because they know that you're going to fill the paperwork yeah. out right yeah they know that you know they're they n- know you're not going to be perform. a big headache yeah you know? like you'll actually wait for the permit before you pour your slab you right. know little things yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah. Let me ask you, I want to go to this, because uh, there's a lot of people out there. Uh, we had a new home builder on a couple of weeks ago, and there was a lot of interest in that episode. What are you seeing the finish outs? What do they need to be in that entry level house? Are we talking granite and stainless steel appliances mm-hmm. and, you know, full hardwood floors are we talking about vinyl plank maybe just dial it back you know let's just you know wizard of oz open the curtain and tell us some of the finish outs that you're seeing are needed in new construction in the starter home bracket so our finish outs that we focus on you know, we, we want to give, even even if it's considered a starter starter home or affordable, we still want to give the people the the sense of that they've got something that they're proud of, you know, so we, we may step it up a little than what some builders may do, but we're definitely going to give you at least a granite or a quartz countertop. Um, you know, the, the colors that are in now on the flooring, we may do a vinyl plank flooring instead of a wood flooring to still give that co- Everybody just wants to look, you know, if you can get this, this cosmetic look, that's when they pull up social media and everyone's homes look like this. Um, You'd be surprised how much you can trade on uh, all of your materials. Again, like what we spoke of earlier with your with your connections and your resources of what you can get done with, especially buying in bulk, because we don't just do one off homes. We're going to do at least five plus doors at a time. Um, so I think as long as you're giving from our experience, we're, as long as you're giving them that look and feel of what the multi-million dollar homes that, that you're not spending that, and you know, it's not you know, high, it's not marble, but at the end of the day, people just want a look and a feel of this is home. They spent the time on it. It feels warm. It feels fresh. It feels clean. 
So really, that's kind of what we focus on, and it could vary, but we definitely do. Um, we don't downplay or or low go to the lowest end of everything. Well, we we spoke on this uh, uh, topic on it with a previous podcast uh, guest, where in this day and age, we're in twenty at least in this market right now in twenty twenty four that buyers have options mm-hmm. so like just barely getting by and barely you know cutting corners doesn't work anymore right because your house will sit on the market mm-hmm. so when it comes to the new builds like are you pulling out all the stops even if it is a entry-level affordable housing like where where i guess what i'm saying is like how i don't know what i'm saying i i just think there's a link to this this uh, topic and I'm trying to formulate a question, but I'm, I'm drawing You're asking maybe yeah, because it's... Please cut. I'm going to cut in line. Because it's affordable. Are we, where are we cutting corners? It, Is yeah. That kind of or, like, I don't want I don't want to say it that yeah. harshly. Right. Like, like, do you see, let's just say hypothetical competition. Do you see them like, oh, crap, we screwed up by not doing the courts, not doing the granite? We haven't been in that situation uh, yet. We try to study the market, study, you know, what everybody else is doing to make sure... He, that we're either in line with that or one step higher or one mm-hmm. feeling higher, or, you know, and again, nowadays too, it's a lot about, there's so much more, you know, we focus on the inside, but then the outside, um, you know, creating more of a community feel, you know, the dog parks, the pools, the amenity centers and that type of stuff. Um, so there's just an overall concept that, you know, if you're in the business, you don't just go build wherever the hell you think you want to go build. You know, what is the customer like and how do you do that? You research the market. You see what people are buying. You you talk to people. You ask, what what would you like in your home? What would you? So we, we take time to really focus on who our customer is and what they're looking for and how can we be consistent with that or, or better or one up, mm-hmm. you know, what the other players are doing in the field. What colors are in now? <laughs> if you say eggshell then it's like uh, not, yeah. nothing changes in 20 years eggshell's not a color sorry go ahead eggshell's the finish yeah uh, adjacent to the real estate <laughs> you know egg on my face i prefer satin over eggshell or how about flat you know, <laughs> i'm sorry i'll stop my gloss. <laughs> okay eggshell white is that is that a better way to say it yeah. What's the color Perfect. of the white? So what colors are in now? Uh, everyone wants the clean, the clean, fresh look, you know, not the dark, dingy. But although there are kind of going back on some of the dark stuff, if you look at some of the things they're doing, black homes on the outside or black interior doors. In Texas? And, yeah. Uh-huh. Golly. Yeah, I know. Can you imagine the heat? Oh. <laughs> I'll just never forget. We were rehabbing this house over by White Rock Lake. It had to be 26, 15 or 16. And my wife, Jennifer, is like, all right, we're painting the walls gray. And I was just like, what? what? Because, mind you, when I first got started a long time ago, everything was white. Yeah. Then it became beige. Then it became white again. Yeah. And then we went to gray. Yeah. And then I heard there was a grayish. Yeah. Now uh, the creams and grays are combining Blue now. cabinets is yeah. a thing. Blue you cab- said white. Yeah. Did you mean eggshell white? Depends on what you're painting, actually. It could be the walls, the ceilings. Mm-hmm. The... I'll die on that hill. Yeah. yeah. I know. You're, you're, and brother, gold is back you in You missed the now. hill altogether. <laughs> yeah. Gold? And gold is back in Well, now. so... Is when that I've... Trump related or just because I, it's back? I don't know, but it's 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 like we do these cycles. Yeah. When I know? started, it was like everything was brass. Yeah. Then I there was like a five or ten year period where all we did was rip brass things out. Yes. And now everything's back to brass or gold. Yeah. It's just oh, no. painful. It, well, I mean, what's funny about that is, if, I mean, think about the years of the rehabs when you rip at the carpet and it was like a lottery <laughs> win when you saw beautiful wood hardwood floors. finish or hardwood floors. It's like, I wonder what's being built now that will be in 20 years be covered up yeah. and then 20 years after that be like oh my god and be like forget this quartz i want for my yeah at <laughs> yeah. least we won't have the asbestos issues with the new <laughs> or, or the lead or whatever the on chinese the, on the drywall new now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so you were talking about keeping on on up to date with the trends yeah if someone's thinking about building rehabbing etc what are some ways that they can go out and evaluate what the trends are and what maybe maybe not what's popular but or or what's not what's common what's popular yeah um 
you have to know your market. You have to know who your client is. You have to know who your customer is. Um, that's really your focus. If you are in this business to make an impact and and to provide housing that people really want, then I mean, you're going to see what the market's doing. You can see where you can maybe, you know, definitely be either equal or how can you one up it. And you want to focus at the end of the day, you can build whatever, but if your customer doesn't like it or your buyer isn't, then, I mean, so that's what you really have to listen to and focus on. What are they buying? What are they looking for? Social media is another thing now. There's so many trends on social media that you kind of see what's in. (laughs) But really, we do a lot on um, being out in the field, being out on the market, seeing what everyone else is doing and really, really focusing on what do the customers or buyers so, want. So how do you know, how we, how are you listening to the audience or listening to the clientele when the clientele is going to buy pretty much everything that everybody puts out there, especially if it's new? Um, is it like, hey, let's try this blue wall and then if it doesn't, if it doesn't get sold, you're like, hey, maybe the blue wall is not a good, good, good choice? No, you. I think... Where we come from, we want everything to be where anyone, regardless of your style or your color choices, if you moved in, you bought this home, the essentials are there, but you may want to paint an accent wall yourself a different color, or you may want to do something different um, in a bedroom or, or whatever. But I think essentially, if you give them a platform where everything it's clean, fresh, looks up to date. And if they want to come in and make some changes themselves to make it more personalized, then they do that. Um, but-, but but what I'm asking, though, is like, because I understand listening to the customer and really knowing mm-hmm. your customer. But if we live in this bubble of, hey, what it, the, it's always going to be eggshell white right, or or gold or whatever. It, and in, unless you're polling the audience, unless the, no, I say audience, unless the, the clientele, mm-hmm. the public, how... How are we getting a good grasp of what the public actually? What are they wants? buying? It's all in. It's all in. That's what It's I'm all on market. Like if so you pull up comps. your market, what are they buying? What are they? What are your? What does your product compare to? What are they doing that? Mm-hmm. And how many days was it on the market? And it sold for this. It sold at sell price. It sold over sales price. So that's going to tell you. Mm-hmm. You know, you can't lie about the numbers or the facts. They right. are what they are. So one of our friends, Blake Johnson, in his signature line, it always said, "Remember, it's your investment, not your home." Right, mm-hmm. and I think it was interesting. You said it earlier. A lot of people kind of go out and build what, whatever the heck they want, right. wherever the heck they want. And maybe you could talk a little bit about. I mean, because what you're saying is you're looking at comps, you're right. seeing what's selling, you're looking at floor plans that are desirable, mm-hmm. maybe houses that didn't sell. Um, so if you were talking and someone's out there, they think they're going to build some houses. What are some trends you're seeing now that you think people should emulate, like? Garage, no garage, uh, mm-hmm. dining room, no dining room, that type of thing. The no, um, the formal dining rooms have gone away. Um, in in most cases now, the formal living room has gone away, and not a lot of new builds are wasting that space on a formal living room. We're replacing that more of an office. I think COVID, um, you know, the big virus word, um, did the a election. spin on that. A lot of people are allowed to work from home now, or choosing to work from home more. So instead of spending that space on a formal dining or a formal living. We're um, making that an office space, you know, right when you walk in, you may have double doors office um, on suite bathrooms instead of used to. They did Jack and Jill's where everybody shared bathrooms. So now it's more so every bedroom has a bathroom within um, instead of sharing bathrooms. That solves the multi-generational housing need. too. Uh-huh. Yeah. So I would say that's a lot of the big. Um, another thing is people are wanting to build where. Definitely, there's something downstairs, at least two bedrooms downstairs with the master and maybe an, uh, another because a lot of people these days are having their parents or the elderly come in and live with them. And is there some way to accommodate that? So that's another. So those I would say those things kind of pop out. Um, yeah, probably the highest things right now that make a lot of sense on selling the product in the homes. And then when it, when it comes to the new new homeowner because it used to be and this is probably not relevant or even but it's just interesting to me uh-huh. is not because it used to be i would assume like a new homeowner would be like the 21 to 25 right. right out of college is it the same or is new homeowners like that 28 to 32 range or in the 40s and the new or homeowner even- these days i think are more in the middle age range um right out of college you know they're more focused on this that 
everyone, not just a certain generation. We're more focused on what's the quickest, easiest way we can travel more. We right. can do this more. How do we just sh- shut our house up and, and go? Everyone's on this go mode now. Um, that either the younger generation is go, 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 go. And then the older generation, we're on the, we want to go as much as we can. So I think it's more for us, our trend is, it's more of that middle aged group where they, they've kind of done all the running. And now I think maybe, you know, the sense of creating a family, starting a family gives them more of the, okay, let's sit down for a minute and, right. and, let's have a house, and, and let's have like, a house versus let's have a yard and let's do this. Let's have a, you know, look for a school district and, and those type of things versus that younger. I mean, it's, it's, there's the more, sky rise yeah, there's thing. more renters these days than there are buyers. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course some of that's because of rates and that kind of stuff. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's interesting. Used to, it was like the American dream to, like buy a home immediately me personally i wouldn't buy anything else to live in right now i would put money in investments not for me personally to live in mm. i mean i'm a fan of investing so i <laughs> tend to agree but you've brought up dog parks pools amenities work from home is that the trend is the trend like the subdivision is now like an ecosystem to live in versus it used to be kind of the place for the wife and kids to be while the Mm -hmm. dad was at work, so to speak. But you're kind of what I'm hearing is it's like live, work and play even in Greenville, which if you're not from Dallas Fort Worth, Greenville's not close to anything other than Greenville. Right. Uh, I mean, it's, (laughs) it's like, Rockwall, where uh, I live, is far enough, yeah. but Greenville's another hour. Uh, I mean, to get to the airport from Greenville, you're you're looking at an hour and forty five minutes. I mean, like it's it's which a, airport DFW from downtown Dallas is about an hour, forty five minutes an hour. I mean, well, not I, on I thirty. Drive. No, yeah, I no, drive. no, yeah, no, yeah. no, 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 <laughs> and not with traffic, but yeah, yeah. in a helicopter. It's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, when you're making all the money on the, you know, with the. Uh, Gary, the Home Depot guy. Yeah. She can afford a helicopter. <laughs> the helicopter doesn't go in the bedroom, though. Uh, okay. uh, yeah, you can't get right. that. So you're, I, I would like to talk a little bit about some of these first-time homebuyer incentives and uh-huh. redeveloping in underprivileged communities. Uh, are there are there a lot of grants and special financing programs in those areas? There are. There's um, grants and special uh, financing, but in order to – there's a lot of red lines and tape on that, um, but you also have to – build a certain product. Um, there's a lot of guidelines you have to follow for grants and and those type of things. So it's not just a lot of people and it's a waiting game on it. There's a lot of paperwork. A lot, a lot of people run from this kind of thing, especially builders, because you're thinking, okay, I, I got the land. I do this. I do this. And now I want to build and go. But if you're dealing with the city on grants and, and these type of special programs, you have to meet um, certain guidelines. You know, there are certain square footage that you have to build. There's certain um, um, amenities that you have to provide. There's a lot of just so dealing with it, the government is not easy is what you're saying. Yeah, it's not easy. Um, <laughs> I've been. Tr- oh, go ahead. Sorry. But it can be beneficial if you have the patience and you have the um capacity to financially fund your projects and and get reimbursed for some things it can definitely oh, so these grants are for the developer i thought i was i meant for like for the home buyer home buyers have their things too but as far as us on the development side there are things that we have to follow guidelines in order to that will allow the buyers to uh, align for these certain grants or or things like that um for instance certain types of financing if they're not a certain square footage, then we could get every buyer we want, but then they can't qualify for a certain type of financing because it's not a certain square footage or it doesn't have a certain amenity that um, that, that grant or that qualification. Energy star yeah, windows right. or All something like that. All that kind of stuff. There's so many like checkpoints to it. So when, you when wanna... you're building homes, how long – I understand building a home for uh, – um, you know, for, listen to your audience, listen uh-huh. to your, your clientele in building specifically for that person. But how often are you reverse engineering to that detail where it's like, hey, we we are targeting this sort of buyer who mm-hmm. will qualify for this sort of financing. Therefore, it needs to be 1300.7 square mm-hmm. feet 
with with eggshell white right. color. <laughs> how often are you doing? Are you, is it how 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 uh, methodical are you in the, in that development? It process? depends on what we're building. Um, our projects right now, a few of our projects, um, the one in South Dallas where we have the townhomes. That is focused on a certain buyer. So we're going to have certain guidelines that we do and provide as a developer for that buyer. Uh, same thing out in Greenville, the 150 homes. We are, um, we had to go make some adjustments on our one bedrooms. They have to be a certain square footage for these guys to qualify for a certain type of loan. Um, has to be a certain type of square foot, a certain, um, square footage. Um, so we are, when, our products focused on the affordable, um, more um, housing. We are going to focus on the guidelines that will allow these buyers to qualify and get these type of homes. So then we have other projects where that's not our focus. Um, we're getting a, now into the commercial space as well, more of, you know, retail and that kind of stuff. So those we're not going to focus on those type of guidelines. It's different buyer, different um, mm-hmm. that kind of stuff. So, um, so it just depends on the product and what you're goal is for that community and not everything's going to be exactly the same so we just have a diver- diverse things that we build and focus on but um, right now it just happens to be two projects that are focused on workforce well, it, that's interesting because it's, it's very similar to a, a, a previous topic we were talking about on a, a different podcast which is if you if you only use one vendor mm-hmm. you have that single point of failure so for you being able to have so many diverse clientele uh-huh. It, it prevents, I guess, getting whacked over the head yeah. with going mm-hmm. out of business. Right. Yeah. 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 Build for Rent has been kind of the darling at the dance for the last three to four years. Mm-hmm. Seems like it's losing some steam. Uh, what made you decide in Greenville to do half and half? Was it a governmental thing or was mm-hmm. it just a exit strategy thing? What was the idea there? It's both. Um, you, you go for what that market needs. And we spend a lot of time in that market talking to the city, um, talking to the people in the city. What, you know, what is that age group? What are they, you know, th- that's an older community Greenville is. Um, so the, like I said earlier, these guys, you know, they, they can't go and afford a, and they don't want a three bedroom home. They want some, they want to own a home. They want ownership, but they want a one bedroom. So, um, it depends on your market really is what your focus is, um, on that. And, and as far as, you know, you can, depending on how you build it, if you individually plat them, then you could always turn around. If you build it as a build to rent, but you plat them individually, you can turn around and sell it. So you have several exit strategies on that product. If so you're, you're not doing the big bulk parcel build for rent that has mm-hmm. to be refinanced on like a multifamily loan no. or sold to an Mm-mm. institutional investor. This is kind of the individual parcel. It could be used for both. Mm-hmm. You could refinance it on a DSCR loan. Someone out there listening could yeah. buy it as an income producing mm-hmm. rental. Or yeah. So the nice thing is I would imagine your HOA is not against rentals. Right. Not against <laughs> rentals. Yeah. I hate HOAs. Did and you it, know that about me? I don't know anybody that likes an HOA. And it depends on how you the set HOA it up. President. Like we're doing a lot of, um, and that's another thing with the city that you really have to get in and dig into. We're doing, um, in Greenville, it's considered a condo detached, um, which allows us, you have to get approval through the city, but that's what allows us to individually plat and survey which when you look at it it looks like a one like what you said one big community on one parcel but you can go through these different types of um there's a a company that we're working with that's assisting us with this they've done several built rent communities throughout texas and other states and there's just just like anything there's just a lot of like fine line and details that you have to get done up front in order to make that available now if you just go build it and don't get all these details aligned up front um You'll be, you'll have headaches trying to undo it, but we're spending a little extra time um, working with this group and getting all that approval done on the front end with the cities that will allow us in the end, if we want to turn around, we get it complete and um, sell to, you know, some of the big guys. Um, that So make assuming sense. you don't have an endless supply of capital, mm-hmm. which if you do, don't worry, I can spend it yeah. for you. Uh, <laughs> are you planning on selling these to individual investors? Are you planning on keeping keeping them yourself? What's the kind of exit strategy for the Greenville? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, for that one, we want to keep a portion as rentals and then sell a portion as well. Um, we also purchase a track of land in front of this residential 
where we're going to do self-storage. Um, retail self-storage is a huge um, thing right now. If you follow the trend, if anyone's doing a multifamily community or housing community, there's usually a self-storage popping up right there by it. Um, I mean, your returns on that are crazy. There's no overhead. So that's another thing that we're focusing on when we buy land. Um, can we bring in the concept of a self-storage area right in that area? You know, we have a tendency to hold on to too much crap that we should, <laughs> you know. So if you're trying to downsize and and buy a home that's, you know, more of um, affordable price, like what are you doing with all your crap? They Move into this one it. bedroom and put your stuff over there. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, um, so yeah, we're, we're just doing a lot of things to make it all make sense um, for now and future. That seems like a great segue to ask the question, what all do you do? <laughs> so my focus is construction and development. You know, these last two years, I've done more of a pivot where um, I think with anyone, you want to focus on what can you provide someone else? What solution do you bring, do you bring to others? And these last two years, my pivot was, I have the construction knowledge, I have the construction background, I'm boots on the ground. What can I bring, what solution can I provide for investors or individuals that need to put money to work? And that, when once I focused on that and kind of zoned in on that, I mean, I... I can pick up the phone on a week's notice and go, hey, uh, you're creating opportunities and then also providing solutions. You know, I'm, I I don't buy anything on market. I buy everything off market. So I'll go buy a piece of land off market for $1.6 that has an appraisal value of 3.8. And then I turn then turn and go to an investor. I'm like, listen, this is the concept idea. This is what we can do on here. This is what our projected returns. This is what we can do. You have money to put to work. They'll come up with the upfront money that acquires the land. Um, we'll focus on there moving forward. I'm the boots on the ground. So I bring the idea. I bring them a solution to for their money. Um, and it's just kind of been turnkey. And in that, I'm managing the project. I love to be on a project. And then I'm also getting equity in every... I will not do a deal unless I get equity in it. Amen. <laughs> How's it been? A uh, little bit of a racy topic here. You know, my wife manages a lot of the construction in our company, uh -huh. and uh, a lot of my guys, the contractors, would much rather deal with me than her huh. because, well, I'm all about the relationship. She's, like, all about our money. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. She, she's approaching it like, yeah, yeah you, you you better fix this. Uh, uh -huh. But as a woman... As a man, if I'm unhappy, I'm just being a businessman. Right. As a woman, if she's unhappy, she's being a bitch. Uh, how is it as a woman running these large uh, construction projects? And I mean, there may be a young lady out there listening right. that's struggling with this. Yeah. Uh, what advice can you give maybe to some women out there uh, that maybe love the construction side but are struggling with, I don't know, personalities right. or maybe even self-limiting beliefs? Yeah. I think my biggest difference in the construction industry, I mean, it, it really kind of falls in line with anything. You know, we all get in these spaces where we want to fit in. We want to look like everybody, want to do what everybody else is doing. But the only way I've been able to level up in my career in the construction industry is being different in this space, but also really knowing your, I was going to say a bad word, knowing your crap and and not knowing your shit yeah knowing your we'll shit this because yeah i was like hey, can i say it but but because you're a woman in the space that's male dominant that's the first thing they're going to test you on are you just coming in here because you want to look pretty and get a deal done and get something special or do you really know your shit so if you come in and you know it first off you gain a whole nother level of earth they're like okay well it, it just kind of and then and then you look different from everyone. So you stand out, yeah. you know your crap. And the other biggest thing I tell anyone, don't shit where you eat. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, you can't play. You can't. You're all about business. Um, I'm appreciative of my guys. I tell them thank you. I appreciate you. Um, but I don't play. I, I, I stay just even tone all the time. I don't change. I don't um, do anything different. I'm the same way every time. And I think as women... You can really use this space. You're going to have to do a little more on the front end to to 
gain the knowledge because you're going to get questioned a little bit more than what the other than maybe the gentleman. But once you've proven yourself and you've stayed consistent on how you run your business and how you handle yourself with the others, I haven't been disrespected in this. I can say when I first started 25 years ago, it was a challenge. But once you've held your ground and made your space, it you're unstoppable because you're totally different from what everyone's used to dealing with. And I'm going to say something else. Like as a woman working on Texas construction projects, learn a little bit of Spanish. Right. Yeah. Because, <laughs> well, Jennifer's fluent yeah. and we'll walk on, you know, she's a pretty woman and guys sitting around will start running their mouths yeah. and they think she doesn't uh-huh. understand and she'll turn, and I don't really speak Spanish, uh, un poquito. Right. But man, she'll turn around and start, bleep, 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 like, I understand you. I heard what you said. That's disrespectful. Get off my job site. Right. Like, and next thing you know, like, it it becomes the real deal when she's on the site. Yeah. They're just, they button their lips and get to work because yeah. they're like, you know, el, el, jefe, el, el jefe, you know, don't play. <laughs> yeah. Or la, el, la jefe, I don't know. I forget. Uh. So as, as we're getting close to the end here. Um, you talked about working with investors and then uh-huh. bringing the deals and whatnot. Um, you know, we pride this is kind of like the, you know, just a real investing the yeah. real stuff. When when you're at networking events or when you, you meet people that are fairly new to the real estate investing world, what are the, the frequently asked questions that they ask you that you wish that they just knew already about construction or what you do specifically or analyzing well, deal or you know i anything. think i think that's a sensitive topic because at the end of the day if people are giving you money they have to trust you and they have to you have to allow that time to answer to stop and answer questions because what i'm finding in the construction space not a lot of people have built anything i mean <laughs> go and ask how many people have you built a home from ground up i mean most people i would say probably 90 percent of the people haven't they would just went and purchased something or they've just invested in something blindly because their friend did um so i think it's very it, it's it's key to you're asking people for millions of dollars um it's key to take the time and answer if you're trying to brush them off or here go look at this or go to that i I don't do business like that. I, I know there's plenty of people out there that, you know, collect money and claim to do this and claim to do this. I'm like, I tell them you can come visit me on this job site. Right. Like if you look at my social media, I'm always going to show myself on a job site because it shows my investors. This is what I'm doing with the money. This is what it it's. A, 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 I'm not driving around in a Bentley and going buying ice and going, yeah, I'm a builder. Like, okay, what the hell? Where are you on the job site? Oh, <laughs> no. well, well, maybe, like, when are you on a job site? Well, when are you I showing asked, what you do? <laughs> maybe I asked the question wrong. Uh, I didn't mean to like in, 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 insinuate that they were wrong asking the questions. It was, it was more just like, what are those questions they ask? That way, you know, the audience can like, yeah. hear those answers. Um, Man, the, the questions are unlimited. Uh, it really is. I mean, most question that you ask, but you can't guarantee this, you know, like, am I guaranteed that I'm not going to lose the money? You can't guarantee right. that to anyone. Um, but you also, you know, when you're getting into these partnerships, you want to spell out and be very detailed about you can lose your ass on this. You can't. I mean, because what happens when you set the tone of this is the worst case scenario, but then you perform like you're a hero, you know, yeah. I mean, so you really you do want to expose everything out there and put it on the table like this is worst case scenario this is middle this is best case scenario and then when you perform and then it's just rinse and repeat after that um but there's really not a everyone asks that you know how well, can yeah I, I mean I, i'll summarize what she just said because you know i raise capital all mm-hmm. the time the number one question investors have is how do i get my money back mm-hmm. and when yeah right like the return is oftentimes their second or third question. Yeah. Right. Everybody asks about the return because that's what they're told to ask on. But their real fear, their real concern is yeah. how am I going to get my money back? Like, mm-hmm. are we refinancing? Are we selling? Yeah. And then they want to know when. Like, yeah. And Time and then she got into the probably the fourth question. You know, and if it all works out, this is the return. But then they want to get into worst case. Like, you know, if it goes bad. How do you handle? It's almost like an interview, like you interview right. a new employee. It's mm-hmm. how have you dealt with a conflict at work before? <laughs> yeah. Like as a capital raiser, you, you just go ahead and address it. You're like, mm-hmm. look, I mean, 
if the market turns or if interest rates go up 100 basis points, here's how we handle that. We right. shift to a rental. We shift to a sale. Mm-hmm. Like You want to have several exit strategies. And I think another big thing that I've taken the time more to focus on these last two years, too, is not everybody is a great business partner for you. And I wish people took more time to treat their business like as if they were marrying someone or getting this lifelong commitment because you can get in business with somebody and they're a complete asshole. And, you know, regardless of what your contract says or what your agreement, they don't know construction, they don't know real estate, but they want to put their money to work. And now they've just become just a pain in your ass. There's a lot of power in no. Yeah, it? right. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I really wish people take have taken more time I, i'm very very particular i get you know people oh, i want to work i want to invest i'm like mm, i need to research you just like you want to interview me i want to interview you just as much I, I think people really need to stop and take not all money's good money and take the time to really focus on who they're getting in these partnerships and agreements with because it's like a marriage right. and it can be very damaging one. and bad. <laughs> I, I think that I think that's a good place to end because, like, I mean, I just shared on Facebook today. There was I saw an article about I, I think there was this capital group out of uh, California that mm-hmm. was being foreclosed on, and they had like three three or four apartment complexes in the DF in the North Texas region. Mm-hmm. And I just posted shared it opportunity, and then everybody was like, "Not all." Literally, it was right. like, "Not all deals are good deals." And, right. And it goes back to the, the 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 old saying in real estate is like. Some of the best deals you do in real estate are the ones you don't do. Right. But uh, I don't want to end on a negative note. I'd rather end on the fact that yeah. you pointed out trust. Trust yeah. is huge in this business. And you got to yeah. trust the people you work with. Yeah. And you just need to fact check everyone. You know, their social media has made this where everybody can get on there and act mm-hmm. like they're an expert. But like, like sh- we did. Yeah. yeah <laughs> like, show me some receipts. Show me where you've been on um title show me where you've done this deal show me where who's your home depot yeah yeah uh, who's your yeah there's so many like really stop using social media as just like this hollywood like oh and they say this and they sell a course but they but, don't. <laughs> but on that note but wait on that note if you want to validate yourself on the internet harper belmont can do that for you Ta-da! that's what i was leading to there we go well but also you you did mention your social media and i want to give you a chance if someone's watching this uh-huh. and maybe they have money or they want to follow up or get to know you or follow you uh you're you're on social yeah. how do they do business with you yeah instagram facebook um instagram's under courtney a hemsley and then facebook's under courtney hemsley and then linkedin as well so mm-hmm. i do everything on social media website there and everything like that so yeah cool. just reach out and um i'll see if we're the right partnership so final thoughts final word anything that you would like to cover before we head out um, final thoughts are, um, you know, just, I would say focus more on doing the research, taking the time. People are so quick to jump into things, whether it's a deal or with people. And I know for me personally, these last two years, this pivot, I've focused more on individuals and how we bring value to one another versus trying to be a fit for everyone. Mm. And these four, three to four individuals that I have as partners or investors right now has skyrocketed my business when before that you were trying to fit in with everyone. So I would say find your niche, find your people and focus on that and try to instead of trying to fit in with everyone else has been a big wise word. Riches are niches, baby. Riches (laughs) niches. The whole 80 20 thing. Yeah. What are you saying? I, I said riches or niches, but then it's supposed to be niches or riches. <laughs> I heard a different word in that in that thing. I was like, we've already I made like, this an E episode, said. so here we go. Well, Courtney, thank you so much yes, for being here. thank you for having me. Plug for Turnus? Yeah, uh, borrow money and pay us back. So. <laughs> or we'll take your assets. <laughs> uh, thank you, everybody, for watching. We'll see you next time.